And the series is called Erase and Rewind. And each week I've said at the start of it that God has given us this amazing capacity. We don't think much about it because we can do it so easily, but this amazing capacity to change our minds, to, to get new information, start thinking about something entirely differently, and in the process change the course of our lives and, and even ultimately change our character. There's a word in the New Testament that's used. I've shared this with you each week. It's used about 58 times. The New Testament originally written in Greek, and the Greek word is metanoia, and it's translated usually repent or repentance. Now, in church world, we've kind of added some thoughts to this. When you hear the word repent or repentance, you think in terms of maybe people coming forward to a, a front of a church, crying, weeping over their sins, begging God for mercy or something like that. But, but that New Testament word didn't have any of those connotations at all. When Jesus used it, that's not the way his hearers would have interpreted it. Here's what the word actually meant. To change one's mind based on new insight, new information, things we didn't know. All of a sudden, we change our mind, change our direction. And that's what the emphasis is on in that word repentance. It is an actual change of direction, an actual change of mind and life. So a lady named Jane Dinscore, and she lived in northeast San Antonio. She's an animal rights activist. Anybody happen to know her? No? Okay. Well, neither did I. But I, I happened to find this article where back in May, she found these two little abandoned kittens. And so, in fact, I think I have a picture. Yeah. And so she took them in, and um, they were so small, they had to be bottle fed. And so she started bottle feeding them, and the little kittens just kind of tore the nipple right up which sort of took her by surprise and then the kittens jumped out of her hands and scratched her up pretty badly and so at this point she thought maybe she had made some kind of a mistake and so she took them into uh, the shelter to talk a little bit and it turned out what she had found and she thought were abandoned were actually bobcats yeah <laughs> so that was actually a picture of a bobcat I showed you you went oh <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes you get what you want but you don't want what you got you know <laughs> so I think she probably changed her mind about being the mother of those two little kittens once she realized that they were not exactly what she thought well we're going to look at today could my practices could your practices use an erase and a rewind do maybe you and I need a loving God to come close to us today when we're willing to be sensitive and humble and objective and talk to us about our practices. Maybe things that we've um, been practicing for many years, if not decades. We're going to turn to a portion of Scripture in the New Testament. It's called the Book of Galatians. And so if you don't mind, turn to page 1315. It'll be Galatians chapter 5, but I'm actually going to turn you to chapter 1. So actually, if you want to turn to page 1311 to get us started. 1311, that's the New Testament book of Galatians. The Apostle Paul planted this church. He was the writer of 13 books in the New Testament, and he planted this church. It's in the area of Turkey, and uh, then he wrote back to the church once he found that some problems had occurred. Some Jewish individuals had come into the church, and they started misleading these brand new Galatian followers of Christ and started telling them that, that they really needed to submit themselves to the, the Jewish laws and to Judaism and that they needed to keep the f festivals and the dietary requirements and a number of other things. And that, yeah, the Messiah was important, but you had to earn your standing with God by keeping these religious ceremonies and so forth. And so the Apostle Paul was greatly upset by this. In fact, look in chapter 1, verse uh, 6. Excuse me, with my glasses. Yeah, it is verse 6. <laughs> and he says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ. Notice, it was the grace, the unmerited mercy and favor, the kindness. God bless you, brother. <laughs> so that's what drew them, uh, deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are following a what? Different gospel, which is a, he says is not one at all. Not that there really is another gospel, but there are some who are disturbing you and wanting to distort the gospel. And that word gospel means the good news of, of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be condemned to hell. So Paul felt very strongly about this. Go to chapter 5 now, 
which is where we're going to spend most of our time. In chapter 5, look, glance if you would at verse 4 and 5. You'll see where the whole book of Galatians is meant to correct this problem. He says, you who are trying to be declared righteous by the law, and this is talking about the Ten Commandments and even the 613 commandments that God gave to the nation of Israel. You who are trying to be declared righteous, in other words, earn a righteous standing with God by the law, have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith or trust, we wait expectantly for the hope of righteousness. So here's the problem. Certain individuals confuse these new followers of Christ. Then they started trying to merit a standing, earn a standing with God, which then became a contrary interior dynamic that literally caused more misbehavior, more, uh, con more behavior contrary to the way God designed them, and not less. So you have to understand, when you read about the law in the New Testament, the law that was given to the nation of Israel, God revealed himself to them in a fragmentary way. The law was never meant to be permanent. The law never had the ability to actually cause somebody to become righteous or realigned with God. It was a fragmentary revelation of God. The Ten Commandments, they tell us a lot about God, but they don't tell us everything about God. The 613 commandments that he gave to the nation tell us a lot about God, but not enough about God to get rid of my fear and my distrust so that now his laws become written on my heart and I love him and trust him from the heart. No, that came with Christ. Christ was the full revelation of God, particularly him going to the cross sacrificially and rising from the dead. Now we have the new covenant or the new testament, the full revelation of God. So the old covenant, the old testament, which was a fragmentary revelation of God, it's passed away. The book of Hebrews deals with this uh, in great detail. Anyway, these early followers of Christ in Galatia were being confused by people that were trying to pull them back under the law, and it was, it was creating bad behavior amongst the people there. So let's pick up reading now in chapter 5, and uh, let, let's start in verse 16. So the Apostle Paul says, But I say, live by the Spirit. Now that word live by, you have to understand, when you're trying to translate one language to another, it's hard sometimes to find the exact word. And so in the, in the original language, the Greek there, it's peripateo. It's the idea of order your behavior under or be guided by, be led by, be governed by. Really hard to translate. Translators all have to use dynamic equivalency at times, which means they try to find a word or words in the modern language that's going to give the idea, communicate the idea of the original or older language. Okay, so he says, but I say live by or be governed by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Now that word flesh again is one of those difficult ones. It's a Greek word sarx and I'll, I'll unpack it for you in a bit but it's, it's usually translated sometimes the old nature or the sinful self different ways but it's one word sarx. For the flesh desires, uh, excuse me, for the flesh has desires that are opposed to the Spirit and the Spirit has desires that are opposed to the flesh. For these are in opposition to each other so that you cannot do what you want. Now, notice conflict. He's talking about real interior conflict that goes on inside of a Christ follower. He's saying that this is, this is normative. This is a process. It is an ongoing process in which we have to choose if we're going to be governed by the Spirit of God or if we're going to be governed by what he calls the flesh. And we'll unpack that, you know, as we go on. But, but, but it's important for us to understand, this is an ongoing process. It's a normal part of being a Christ follower. So if you sometimes feel these two opposing forces, you feel pulled, let's say, towards something that you know not to be God's will, but then you feel something pulling you to resist it, well, that's this battle going on, okay? So let's go on. He says in verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit... You are not under the law. Now, he's going he's gonna to give you a diagnostic. He's going to say, if you're wondering if the flesh is what's governing your perspective, if you want to know, he says, here's how you can tell. These are the things that being governed by the flesh produces. So let's look at this list. Hang on tight. Here we go. He says, now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality. 
Um, the Bible, sexual immorality, is any kind of sexual activity that's not between a husband and a wife. Now, the works of the flesh are sexual immorality, impurity, depravity, idolatry, sorcery, hostilities, strife. What's the next one? Jealousy. They, they, these guys are the only ones reading with me. How many's got their Bible open? Can I see your hands? Okay, come on, let's, let's, let's get together now. All right, let's go back. Jealousies, outbursts of anger, selfish rivalries, dissensions, factions. And what is the next one? Envying. And look what's right beside envying. What's the next one? Murder. Now, look at that. You know, envy we think of as being, ah, you envy somebody, big deal. Right beside murder. And what he's saying is that, that if we're living, being governed by what he's calling the flesh, and I'll unpack that in a bit, that all these various things can be produced. It just depends on the circumstance and the person. So he goes on. Envying, murder, drunkenness, carousing, and similar things. Notice, he's not writing a comprehensive list. He says, and similar things, all kinds of things. By, by the way, uh, this is one of those big sin lists in the Bible, but there's numerous sin lists in the Bible. This is not meant to be comprehensive. I'm going to say something rather rapidly. It'll be on the video so that you can re-watch the video and copy these down and examine them. The sin list, if you're curious about the sin list, albeit I hope it doesn't give you any ideas. You might say, oh, I never even knew that one existed. I'm going to try that. But here they are. Um, you have one in Romans chapter 1, verse 28 through 32, a real comprehensive one. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. Mark chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. Revelation 21, 8 and Revelation 22, 15. So if you want to look at some of these lists. So the idea, he's not saying this is every sin there is to sin. He's just saying, hey, let me give you an idea how you can know if you're being governed by this um, fleshly perspective or outlook on life. All right. Now he says, now on the contrary, if you're being governed by the Spirit, here's what it will produce. But the fruit of the Spirit, and notice it's fruit, it's the idea that we're in a relational union with Christ. Our trust bonds us, binds us to Him. And so it's this organic, natural thing that this closeness to Christ, this understanding that our sins are forgiven, that we're, we've been given the gift of everlasting life by Christ, that we are alive because He is indwelling us and He's going to help us to grow. It produces this kind of stuff. And so He starts listing it. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And what is the next one? Self-control. Self Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ have, past tense, crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. What is he talking about there? Because he's just said we're going to be struggling with this stuff. And now he says we've crucified it in the past. That's talking about conversion. When a person goes from self-directed living, puts their trust in Christ, and now joyfully follows him fully, freely, and forever, it puts to death that fleshly principle of governance over our soul, which I'll, I'll talk about again. Now, now, what it means is it breaks its power. It doesn't mean that it goes away. We wouldn't still be struggling with it according to that passage. Okay, so could my practices use an erase and rewind? Now, here's the thing that is important when we went through that list did you see anything in there that's one of the practices you have in your life that's where we have to start when you go to the doctor the doctor does a diagnostic on you or I the doctor then gives us test results we may not like the test results but unless we will receive the test results there's no chance of getting well and this is the loving great physician saying, if these things are happening, they're contrary to your design. They're sand in the, in the inner machinery of your soul. These things will always, always bring consequences, if not immediately, ultimately. So a loving God is pulling us all close and saying, come on, let's, let's take a look. Let's see if maybe some of our practices need an erase and a rewind. Now, there's a verse in the New Testament in Romans chapter 8 that I want to turn you to, and then, then we'll talk a little bit more about this flesh or sinful principle. It says, those who live following their sinful selves, that's that same Greek word, sarx, flesh, hard to translate, um, think only about the things that their sinful selves, what? Want or desire. When we're governed by the flesh or the sinful self, our mind is focused on our desires 
and, and, we're, and we're devoted to our desires. But those who live following the Spirit are thinking about the things the Spirit, what is word, wants or desires them to do. So it's two different ways of living. The one person, the Christ follower, is focused on what the Spirit of God wants them to do. I want to know that. I want to follow that. I'm focused on that. I'm orienting my life around that. The other person is not. It says, if people's thinking is controlled by the sinful self or flesh, there is death, deterioration, destruction, always. It's inevitable. It's, it's not if, it's only when. But if their thinking is controlled by the Spirit, there is life and peace. When we're living the way God designed us, which is the way the Spirit leads, then we develop and grow. Now, here's where this gets interesting. What does it mean to live by the Spirit or live governed by the Spirit or live led by the Spirit? What is it talking about? Christians, those that have been in church world for a long, long time, they have a lot of interesting ideas about it. And, and we usually think in terms of, okay, I got, I got to tell, I got to watch and keep a, a sensitized inward watch to see if the Holy Spirit's leading me. Are you leading me, Holy Spirit? Is that you putting that thought in my mind? Or is that the flesh putting that thought in my mind? And we go back and forth with this kind of thought process. But wh what is it really talking about? Paul is contrasting those that were being led by the law of God, that fragmentary revelation given to the nation of Israel that really pretty much just diagnoses how needy and broken we are it was there temporarily to bring us to the place where we would finally trust in the fullness of God in Christ. So what does it mean to be led by the Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit had complete expression, freedom of expression in Jesus. Jesus is God revealing all of his fullness, all that we can ever take in. He is revealing it to us, particularly in his crucifixion, his sacrificial death. We see that our God, the almighty God, is sacrificially loving. Therefore, he is safe. He is the safest person in the universe. He is trustworthy. He is love incarnate. And all this revelation was meant to break down our fear of an almighty being, free us from our guilt and shame because Jesus came offering mercy and forgiveness and bring us back into a trust relationship with our creator. And the scripture is very clear. It says that man, mankind, humanity can't live without God. It says we were made by Christ and for Christ and apart from him, life can't hold together. And so to be led by the spirit is to be led by, you got to get this some of you that have been listening to inner voices for years. It is to be led by the revelation that God has given of himself in Jesus. And the New Testament is where it's all recorded. To be led by the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, is to be led by the information that God has now given to us that is recorded in the New Testament. Jesus said in John 15 and 16 that when the Holy Spirit came, he would testify about Jesus. John 16, that the Holy Spirit would show believers how to be led into the truth about Jesus and so when we are led by the spirit it means that this revelation that God has now given of himself in Jesus and it's recorded in the rest of the New Testament we have absorbed it it's saturated our souls it saturated our minds and it now directs it now direct is that me is you <laughs> uh, it now directs our thinking or that old flesh governed perspective. And, I, and I'm going to break that down for you here in just a minute. Uh, one last verse I'll share with you, and then I'll show you something. In the book of Galatians, again, it says, The harvest you reap reveals the seed that was planted. If you plant the corrupt seeds of self-life into this natural realm, you can expect to experience a harvest of corruption. It goes on. If you plant the good seeds of the spirit life, you will reap the beautiful fruits that grow from the everlasting life of the spirit. In other words, it's where we invest our lives, we're going to reap the results from. Now, so what does it mean then to be uh, led by the flesh or governed by the flesh, however, however you want to look at that term? Well, I shared this little chart with you uh, a week or two back. And this natural perspective, this is where we can get an understanding of what the scripture means by that, that term sarks, the flesh, the sinful self. The person, before they have trusted in Christ, they have a natural perspective. They look out at life and they, they observe what they can see with their senses. First of all, they're time bound. They know that they had a birth day. They know they'll have a death day. We're bound by time. We can't see into eternity. 
We're sense governed. If I can't see it, taste it, feel it, touch it, smell it, hear it, I don't know for sure if it exists. And so that governs my sense of reality. And I'm driven by the fear of death, whether I think about it or not. I do know that the day is coming, and here's how it shows itself. I first and foremost seek to preserve my life. Self-preservation becomes number one, and self-gratification or fulfilling my desires, finding something I like, something, finding something I enjoy that's pleasurable, that becomes number two, which makes me very vulnerable to do things that are contrary to my design or things scripture calls sin. I'm just simply trying to make the best of it. I only go around once in life, and so I have this fatalistic desperation that I go through life with, which tends to make me do things that I should not, things that are unwise. Add to this, when the scripture talks about flesh, add to this perspective, I gain certain experiences in life, I receive certain wounds in life, I start believing certain things, whether they are true or not. I form opinions. I form habits. And all of that together is what Scripture means by the sinful self or the flesh. It's me and my full development like this apart from God. Now, when a person turns to Christ, they put trust in their Creator and become the follower of Christ that we were all designed to be. We have a spiritual perspective. Instead of time-bound, now I look at life from an eternal perspective and I know that I'm a being that's going to live way past this life. I'm revelation governed. God has revealed the truth about himself and the truth about life and things to come. That now fills my mind and governs me as opposed to my senses. And then I'm driven by the certainty of everlasting life, not the fear of death. I don't have to get it all now. You can't get it all now anyhow. And so I patiently wait on the kingdom that's going to provide all the deepest desires the human hearts have ever had and provide them for everyone all the time and forever. So that's the great difference between the two. So here's the next little thing I shared with you. This is the way it's supposed to work out when we're led by the Spirit, walking in the Spirit. Our God-given perspective creates values. We now see God says this is important, that's not important. That forms my values. From my values, I establish priorities. My priorities are schedules that are supposed to support my values being carried out very carefully in my life. And then from my priorities are meant to be my practices. I only do those things that fit within this revelation of what God says was designed and appropriate and beneficial and constructive rather than destructive. So that's the way it's supposed to work. But that's not the way it always works. You know it and I know it. Sometimes the truth is, we go along in life for a while, and we go pretty well, and yet we may know, if we're Christ followers, we may know that some of our practices, our actual practices, are contrary to the Word of God. But we're not convinced that they're, that they're hurtful. We don't see any consequences. We don't see anything happening. It's not hurting us. It's not hurting others. Maybe it's even something secret. And so we're even more convinced. There's nothing exactly wrong with this. Even though God says that it's not right, it's not the way he designed me, I don't really see any problem here. Maybe some of us are even, uh, we're, we're just in the dark because we're young believers. We haven't had time to learn what God says in his word about the way he designed us, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. So for whatever reason, we're practicing some things that are contrary to God's will, which is the way he designed us. But we don't feel like it's, it's a big deal. We don't feel like it's bothering us. We don't feel like anything's happening. How many of you have ever seen a sinkhole? Can I ask, ask, see your hands? Okay, here's a picture of an unfortunate person. Um, evidently didn't see that sinkhole till it was too late. Now sinkholes are interesting because a sinkhole it just suddenly happens. The road was good. Maybe that road was good for months, years, maybe decades. That person could drive on that piece of road and everything was fine. And then suddenly they drove on the same road that they had been driving on for years or decades that was fine, at least as far as they knew it was fine. But all of a sudden, the very same road that they thought was fine, it collapses. And it becomes something extraordinarily dangerous. So it happens all of a sudden, a sinkhole. But not really. Not really. It, it seems to us that it's happening all of a sudden, but it's not really all of a sudden. You see, what was actually happening, maybe for years, maybe for decades, is that the ground underneath of the road was slowly eroding away, 
slowly eroding. And sometimes we are still practicing things that are contrary to the way God designed us. We're convinced, hey, it's no biggie, it's no big deal, it's not bothering me, not hurting anybody else, nobody knows, you know, nobody's the loser. And what we don't know is this thing is eroding, eroding, it's deteriorating components of our soul, and then suddenly something breaks, something happens, there's a collapse of some sort, and we wonder, why did this happen? How did this happen? Never thought I'd do that. And yet the erosion, the erosion had been taking place for a long time. Folks, listen. One of the hardest things for us to really become convinced of as human beings is that, and this is real simple stuff, but it's just the truth, is that when our loving God, our creator, when he tells us these things are never good for your soul, these things are always good for your soul. We have a very hard time believing that. We say, ah, you know, I can see that and that, but I don't see anything wrong with that, that, and that. And until you and I become completely convinced that everything that God labels as sin, which just means it's something that's contrary to the way God's designed us, until we become convinced, convictions at our heart that everything God says is sin, that it's, that it's going to hurt me. It's truly destructive. It may not hurt me today. It might be a decade from now before the collapse comes, but come it will. Until I become convinced of this, I can tell you we're going to have problems and we're going to still find ourselves practicing some things that are contrary to our good. You see, it's hard for God to get us to trust him on these kind of issues. But unless we do we'll find ourselves, again, not walking in the Spirit, living this, this new life that's going to go right into eternity that Christ wants us to live. So we get what we want, but we don't end up liking what we get. Now, on the contrary, we have a choice. We could give what God wants, and we'll love what we get in return. All God wants of us is to be willing to trust Him and to, to be humble and to be teachable. That's it. That's all He wants from us. And if we do that, if we're willing to give him our trust, our humility, our, our teachability, then he'll bless us with the life that we have always really sought and wanted. Romans 8, 13 says this way, or 8, 12. No, it was 13. Uh, if you use your lives to do the wrong things your sinful selves want, you will die spiritually. See, we don't necessarily recognize what's happening, but our conscience and our God-enlightened reason is dimming and becoming less functional and less dominant and we're, we're becoming skewed inside and we can't make good decisions. We're becoming desensitized. We don't even know what's happening. But if you use the Spirit's help to stop doing the wrong things, notice the Spirit, that revelation of God in Christ that's preserved for us in the New Testament, if we let this, this truth strengthen us, motivate us, guide us, direct us, if we use the Spirit's help to stop doing the wrong things you do with your body, you will have true life it's just the way things work there's an inevitability about it let me show you this little little chart that i developed this is what you and i are like before we return to christ our creator in trust before we're reconciled to god before we become followers of christ because he has won our trust our desires are big they grow disproportionate and they govern our lives we start out as babies you know you have some physical desires you cry when you cry somebody comes and gratifies that desire so you start learning a pattern in life get your desires met and you feel better our desires grow and grow because we don't know who we are we don't know why we're here we don't know the meaning of life and so forth so our emotional and physical feelings that's what i mean by our desires they control and they govern our reason. In other words, my mind starts scheming, starts planning, how can I get my desires fulfilled? Our whole life starts revolving around, how can I get what I want, in other words? That's the way we live. Our conscience, it's lost its function. It becomes dull and distorted because it doesn't want to cause these desires to be frustrated, so it just gets non, you know, kind of non-functional so that it's not causing too much pain. We can all remember that certain things we once did that really hurt our conscience, we do them many, many times until finally we don't feel it at all. When a person turns to Christ, though, this is the way they look inside. Uh, once we trust Christ, now our God-enlightened reason 
and our God-calibrated conscience, they take on great prominence. That's the way we were meant to function. Our God-enlightened reason and our God-calibrated conscience was meant to be the dominant governing part of our inner world. It was meant to control and govern our desires. In our better moments, we all know this. For example, let's say you're, you're in a workplace and you suddenly have a desire to say something maybe very angrily to your boss. How many of you have ever had an experience like that? You wanted to say something very angrily to your boss. Okay, many of us have. But most of you didn't do it. <laughs> because even though you desired to do it, you didn't want to lose your job. And so your reason asserted its might and stopped your desires. It governed your desires. But we can't do that ongoing. We can only do it in short spurts. So if I could have that drawing back. So this is the way God means for us. As we're growing spiritually, as we're investing in spiritual things, as we're studying God's word regularly, as we're praying regularly, as we're giving regularly, as we're serving, as we're maybe uh, meeting with other believers in groups and all these various things, as we're practicing doing the Lord's Supper, there's lots of various practices that strengthen us spiritually so our God-enlightened reason is growing strong, which was God's intention. Our God-calibrated uh, conscience is getting to be an accurate monitor now. And because it's growing in strength, our desires grow smaller. Those appetites come under control, and we live the way God designed us to live. We weren't meant to be governed by our desires and our feelings. We were meant to be governed by our God-enlightened reason. That's living in the Spirit, being led by the Spirit. That will produce those things we read Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So this is the way this life works out between the flesh and the spirit. Now, remember I said it's a struggle. Some of us, we're stuck. We've got like some habits that we just can't seem to kick. We hate them. We don't want to do them, but, but try as we will. We do good for a while. It's two steps forward and three steps back, and we get discouraged, and we get so fixated on the one habit that we can't conquer that we get discouraged. Listen, a lot of times what we have to do is focus on staying spiritually strong and healthy because if you're spiritually strong and healthy, you're going to do a lot better ultimately dealing with that habit. And sometimes we need some structure to deal with certain habits. We, we need some help, some human support maybe. Um, for example, to show you how something like this works, you, you might be embroiled in, in an argument with someone inside your house. It might be a friend, family member, uncle, who knows. But then you hear a knock on the door or the doorbell ringing, and you go to answer the door, and all of a sudden you see a little Girl Scout there selling Girl Scout cookies. You could go from instant rage to being very calm and collected. So we say things like, well, I get, I get mad and I can't control myself. Yes, we can if there's enough structure or certain people that we don't want them to see us behaving that way. And, and so sometimes when you're, when you're stuck with a habit, you need to create some structure and maybe you need, need to get some help. But don't get discouraged. I mean, keep, keep fighting the fight. This is a process. It's an ongoing battle. All right. Uh, let me close with what I found to be a very interesting thing. There's a guy named William Walsh, and he's a scientist from Illinois. In the year 2000, he decided he wanted to do a study on Beethoven, on what was it that caused the death of Beethoven. Beethoven died at age 57. In fact, show him up here. Beethoven had exceptionally good hair. And uh, <laughs> so because of his good hair, Walsh decided to take a strand or two and analyze the hair to try to find out what killed Beethoven. And what he found was fascinating. He found that in Beethoven's hair, which meant it was in his bloodstream ultimately, there, there was a hundred times more lead than what is normal for a human being to have. And he thought, how in the world did this guy get a hundred times more lead? That must have been what killed him, surely. And what he found was this. Beethoven had a habit. He had a practice, a practice that had he been more aware, uh, he might have lived longer. He liked to relax in some mineral spas that were near him. And he went very regularly to relax in the mineral spas. Well, in these relaxing moments, he was soaking up lead in abundance. And so you got to listen to this. So what he thought was a practice that relaxed him, gave him some relief, gave him what he wanted, fulfilled his desires. 
was actually slowly destroying him. I'm convinced that God's saying to some of us, you're going up and down that road in your life with those practices and you think all is well with your life and soul. You're Beethoven. You're finding this practice to be enjoyable or give you some kind of fulfillment or relief or whatever. And you don't think anybody gets hurt. And the toxicity is building up. Take the other analogy, the sinkhole. The ground is eroding below and you don't know it. Some of you, God brought you here today. I know this. A loving God brought some of you here today. This is just for you. There are practices he's been trying to get you to deal with for years, maybe decades. And he's trying to say today very specifically to you, your time is running out. I love you. Let's avoid this. Some of us, he's trying to say, your life is not oriented around spiritual matters. And because of that, your soul, your spirit, is in a weakened state. And your flesh, your old self, whatever you want to call it, it's governing your life too much most of the time. And he's saying to some of you, you, you need to re-examine and reschedule and reorient your life so that you're getting a lot of spiritual input and nutrition. I mean, things like going to church, studying the Bible, prayer, all these things I mentioned before, they all build us up. The Lord's, the Lord's Supper, communion, they strengthen us. And for some of you, he's saying, you've really got to get your life reoriented around this. So I don't know which it is. I do know I'm, I'm convinced at core that, that God meant this very personally um, for all of us, myself included, but, but for some of you in particular that are, that are closer, closer to a fork in the road than you ever expect. Let, let's pray, then I'm going to come back. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, one of those things that does strengthen us spiritually when we understand what it is. Father, you know us. You, you're trying lovingly to call us away from danger today and into health and righteousness and life and peace. Give us the humility and the sense to hear your voice and to take all the action we need to take. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.